Hi, everyone. Uh, incredible morning, eh? Uh, really good talks going on. And uh, today I want to talk about discovery. So I was nine years old. Uh, I was walking out of a Boy Scouts meeting with some friends, pudgy little kid. I walk out, I look up into the sky at night, and I see this. Does anybody remember this? This is Comet Hale-Buff. Anybody at all? Oh, a couple of people. Awesome. Uh, so I, as with a lot of people at that time, I was just captivated by how beautiful and mysterious at the time such an object was. It really got me curious, and it was really the start of my career in a lot of ways. Uh, I remember one of the teachers I had at the time was saying, oh, hey, guys, don't worry. It's got to go away, but it'll come back. And that really struck me, and I was like, why? Why is it going to do that? Why is it going to go away and come back? And the teacher said, well, gravity. And so from that point on, and, and little by little, I was just, just so curious and, you know, asking, starting to ask questions, getting that ball rolling. And, you know, it turns out that gravity has a really rich and interesting history. Isaac Newton was one of the first people to put forth this overall sort of theory of forces. And he described gravity as a kind of force that acts between two objects, you and me, a planet and a star, so on and so forth. And this is a very powerful notion. He was able to show that the force that pulls an apple from a tree to the ground is the same one that has the moon go around the earth and the earth go around the sun. <laughs> and these ideas have been widely used in applications of engineering and physics, of course. And we're taught this here at, at UBC and universities across the globe. But of course, Albert Einstein, and we all heard Einstein, show that actually gravity is not so simply described that way. Gravity is not actually a force. It's actually the warping or the curvature of what we perceive to be space and time. Now that sounds really abstract, right? It's a very elegant theory, very complex, very mathematical. But at the same time, it's been tested, it's been vetted, it's passed all these tests with flying colors. So the, the theory so far really does describe how nature works on the largest of scales. And so this understanding is, is great. It's, you know, it's brought about a lot of understanding and a lot of technologies along the way. But of course, there are still a lot of mysteries to solve. And this pie chart here shows that really well. So if you look at the smallest sliver, the, the yellow sliver, sliver it's, it's, it says ordinary matter. And that makes up 5.9% of the whole universe. So this shows the contents of the universe, what the universe is made of. And so ordinary matter, what is that? Well, we're made of ordinary matter. It turns out that people, planets, stars, galaxies, dust, uh, gas, and space, all that stuff that a lot, of, a lot of people would think is everything, makes up only 5% of the universe. And we see it you know, by experiments, light, and so on and so forth. So think about it. That means that 95% of the universe, not only do we not see it, we don't get it. And isn't that, that's, that's nuts, isn't it? I mean, that's a very jarring concept that we've been able to learn so much but we can't see dark energy, which is this sort of invisible energy in empty space that forces the universe to expand at an accelerating rate. And we can't see dark matter, which is a mysterious stuff, like normal stuff, but if we can't see it. Light does not interact with it. And so there's a 95% of the universe that's invisible. And so some of us here at UBC and others, including myself and some of us across the globe, are trying to see that 95%, or at least some part of it that no one has ever seen before. So we're, we're, we're on the hunt for a phenomenon called gravitational waves. So remember that Einstein's theory says that gravity is the warping or the curvature of space and time. Gravitational waves, by extension, is the rippling of space and time. So think of a ripples in a pond. You toss a stone into a pond, and when it falls in, you see these waves propagate out from, from where the stone fell. And those are gravitational waves, essentially. Just replace the water with space and time. It's that simple. So. So Einstein's theory says that, well, these waves should exist in nature, and they should be caused by accelerating mass, meaning that the next time you know, you're running late to class and you're bolting to chase down the V-line bus that's probably already full to begin with, you're actually generating gravitational waves as you run. The catch, the problem, is that they're so weak, and it's because they're so weak that we have never seen them before. <coughs> and a lot, of th a lot of theorists have done a lot of great work and shown that actually these things are very useful, and I'll get I'll get to that in a bit in terms of what they'll tell us. But the idea is that there's a, lot of variety, there's a variety of experiments out there that are trying to detect these things within the next decade. I'm part of one of these experiments that studies these really cool, compact, extreme objects in space called pulsars. And the smaller little star here that you see in this diagram is that pulsar. So what are pulsars exactly? So pulsars are these tiny, old, compact remnants of old stars. 
they're highly magnetized, and so they shoot these beams of light from their magnetic poles, and they rotate really fast, leading to this kind of lighthouse effect that you see here. And so to get a sense of how extreme these stars are, let's look at a map of Vancouver. So here's a map taken from Google. I drew a red circle on this that has a radius of about 10 to 12 kilometers. <coughs> this radius is the same radius of that pulsar, the sphere that makes up the pulsar. So if you take something like the sun, as large as it is, and compress it to a sphere that has a radius of this circle, that gives you a pulsar. That's physics. That's, in, that's insane, but it's real. We see it in nature. And so by themselves, pulsars are very interesting things to study. They tell us a lot about fundamental physics. You'll always hear that from pulsar astrophysicists. Fundamental physics. We're learning about nature and its fundamental aspects. But like I said, we're using these things to really push the boundaries and, and see an invisible universe. And so when it comes to how useful these pulsars are by themselves, this schematic essentially shows that. They rotate really fast, they're very massive, and all those things combined allow them to be very stable rotators. And what I mean by that is that, so each of these little bars here uh, represents one pulse that we see, right? And the idea is that these things are separated very, very regularly in time. And so when you see one pulse and you see another, you can measure the difference in time. And then when you see the, all subse the other subsequent pulses, that, that time difference is nearly the exact same time difference corresponding to the rotation. So th that makes these things incredibly useful objects to study in general. And when it comes to gravitational waves, in this case, I've assumed that there's no gravitational wave and that there's nothing funny going on around the Earth. And so by themselves, we should see this regularity. But when a gravitational wave passes by, which is shown by these little blue things that I drew here, the story is different. Remember that gravitational waves is the rippling of space and time. So as, as these pulses travel across space from the pulsar to the Earth, especially for the ones closest to the Earth, that, irreg that, irregu that regularity goes away. The pulses become irregular. And again, it's due to the fact that space and time are rippling. <clears throat> and so this is a, essentially, this is how we would see gravitational waves. And when we're seeing gravitational waves, we see gravity. And that's a really neat sort of concept, because we always see the effects. Like I said, when it comes to things like dark matter, dark energy, black holes, we see the effects of those things, but we have not seen those things themselves. And that's a key distinction. And so while you know, studying these pulsars are really cool and we can take data of them and that's great, we need to see a lot of these. Because if we see the same sort of irregular signature at the same time in different pulsars, we, we actually get a good sense, hey, we found something here. We might have found a gravitational wave. And so what this schematic shows you here is what we call a pulsar timing array. And it's an array of pulsars all across the sky at different distances with different properties that uh, we study in order to see these things. And the more pulsars we find, the better, and that's a big part of what we do, and I'll actually get back to that towards the end of my talk in hopefully a very cool way. And like I said, okay, so we're trying to make a discovery. We're trying to find these things that should exist in nature, but they don't, but we don't see them. And that's, and that's an important thing here. So the next time you see a really pretty image of the universe, of galaxies, and, and stars, and dust, and all that stuff, remember that that only makes up 5% of the whole universe. Okay, so what kinds of things can we learn in the beginning? So when we see gravitational waves, we'll see black holes. Remember, black holes are these really neat consequences from Einstein's theory that say that if you compress a mass to a tiny point, you essentially get this really extreme object with just tons of gravity and emits no light. These things, they're called black because they emit no light whatsoever. So if you're looking in space and you're actually looking at a black hole, you can't tell. You don't see it. But if we find these things orbiting stars, if we find these things moving through space, we'll see the gravitational waves generated by these objects. And that's very neat, because in the literature, when you look at papers and stuff about black holes, they're always referred to as candidates, because we're almost certain they exist, we have great evidence that they exist, but we don't see them. And gravitational waves allow us to see them. Another thing is the beginning of the universe, or as the way I like to think of it, the beginning of time. That sounds really epic, because it is epic. We can't, so far, so far we, can't, we can't look back just with light. Light has its own limits. The beginning of the universe was chaotic, it was messy, it was hot, it was dense, and a lot of the light generated at that time was being absorbed, it was being blocked. The universe was, as we call it, opaque. <clears throat> and so when we look back in time with telescopes and distances and stuff, we don't, there's a limit. We can't see farther than some time shown here. Gravitational waves are a different story. They don't interact the same way with matter as light does. And so by finding these gravitational waves and characterizing them, we can learn about the first seconds of the universe. And that, that's revolutionary by itself, too. 
because we'll learn about how the universe was born, how it formed, the conditions, all these things that have you know, generated just tons of interest over the centuries and can really point the way to, to showing us how exactly we got here. But the big overall thing that I want to sort of emphasize is that we're essentially, as we like to say, we're opening, we're opening up a new window. Like I said, on the left here, there's, there's one window that has the label electromagnetic waves. This is the fancy word for light. X-rays, UV, optical. And, and from, from all these studies with telescopes, ground-based stuff, space-based experiments, we've been able to see all these really awesome things, planets, stars, galaxies. And, and that's great, but again, that, that stuff really only constitutes 5% of the universe. And we get evidence for the other 95, but we don't see that 95%. So by studying and characterizing and making sense of gravitational waves, we essentially open up an entirely new window to the universe. And so while there are things that we can get a sense of what we'll learn more about, like I said about the beginning of time and black holes, we don't really know what else we'll see. And we're bound to see new things, things we can't even conceive of right now. Now, like I said, I, you know, and I, I've been talking about making discoveries, you know, in this case, using pulsars, these really awesome stars in space to find gravitational waves, these really awesome predictions, uh, and using these things to make sense of the universe around us, especially when we don't know most of it, 95% of it even. <coughs> but there's a third aspect of discovery I want to talk about, and that's communicating that discovery. And so what do I mean? Here I am today, talking with you awesome people about this awesome stuff, and I'm sure a lot of us can relate to it. Those of us in our field, really passionate, really driven, we want to we want to go out and talk with people. We want to out, we want to reach out. We want to, you know, just share the kind of knowledge that we have and get people excited about what we do. And so some some great collaborators of mine shared that vision and had a great idea. They say, hey, listen, as I mentioned earlier, one of the one of the things that we do among all the kind of research fields and, and subjects that we do is that we try to find new pulsars. We try to find these cosmic lighthouses, as I like to call them, as a way of to help sort of solidify understandings and to help see gravitational waves even, even better. And so these collaborators said, collaborators said, hey, we need to do this stuff, everyone's working on it, but it's also a really cool idea. The idea is that you're taking all this crazy data and you're trying to actually find, find stuff, you're trying to find stars. So why don't we try to get people involved? Why don't we try to like, inspire young adults, kids, to actually get in on this, like actually do real science. We train them, we do, they do real science with us, they actually you know, play with data that's ex taken exclusively for them, and who knows what they'll find, who knows what they'll, what they'll get. And so this, as a nice way to end, there's this clip here that I'd like to show you of a documentary called Little Green Men. Uh, it's directed by Sarah Kohlberg, and it's produced by Dr. Maura McLaughlin, a collaborator of mine who actually was one of the creators of this program called the Pulsar Search Collaboratory. It's basically a program where high schoolers apply, they get in, and they get, like I said, they get trained to understand what pulsars are, physics, all these kinds of things but they also get trained to, to use data, data analysis techniques, and then they actually go and they perform scientific research. These kids actually do real research. And so what this clip is showing you is that two kids, the first, the first kid and now this girl, both in high school, you can tell they're excited about something, right? <laughs> and, and so what, what they're talking about to the camera, and I wanted to show the audio, but I also wanted to sort of give some context, is that they're, they're talking about how working together they poured through some data and found a pulsar. These kids found a star no one's ever found before. So think about that. What better way of instilling you know, the, the wonder and the awe and the usefulness of these discoveries than by having them actually make these discoveries themselves? You know, I, think, I, I like to think, and I'm sure a lot of us do, that that's a really neat, unique way of doing that. And, you know, when, and again, this is just a small clip of a 15, 20 minute documentary that I encourage you guys to find online on Google. Just type Little Green Men trailer and it'll pop up. And it's, it's just a tr one of many truly won wonderful, great programs that really try to reach out to kids and essentially do cover all those things where, you know, you do science, you use that science, and then you com communicate that. And so whether you're, you know, a pudgy little nine-year-old trying to, you know, seeing a comet for the first time, or if you're a high schooler or two or several discovering your own star that no one's ever seen before, or if you're a bunch of people working together to solve problems you know, in your field, these discoveries matter. And they can lead you to the next big thing. Thank you. <laughs>